Let's make it chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that, create, that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And then in chapter 2 and verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Father, anoint the preacher and your word as it goes forth. Father, and may they receive it, not as the word of a man, but the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I call your attention to chapter 2 of the book of Genesis in verse 7. The scripture says he formed him of the dust of the ground. And the scripture says he called their name Adam. They in the sense of mankind, in a collective sense. The word Adam is a generic word. What's it mean? You do the etymology of the word, run the root, and you'll find out that it means literally of the earth. And so the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam is the Lord from heaven. This first Adam, therefore, is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is in many ways. And so he set before us as the beginning of mankind. You'll notice the scripture is very clear and definitive in its statements. It's not un it makes a clear statement that the man is made in the image of God. And therefore, God did something with the man that he'd never done before. No doubt in my mind that the angel creation was standing there watching as he created the earth and he made the animal creation. These are creatures that breathe and they're walking about on the face of the earth. But then he, he creates the, the, the crowning achievement and that is that he takes a handful of dirt and from that dirt he creates the body, forms the body of the man and then he breathes into that body the breath of life and that man becomes a living soul. Now how much the angels knew of this before it happened, scripture doesn't tell us. It may very well be that they knew nothing of it and they were simply there to observe the mind and the hand of God as it begins to create on this earth something that had never existed before. The man Adam a living soul in the image of God. That image, my dear friends, a theme that runs from Genesis through Revelation. He lost that image, but the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the very express image of God, as it says in Hebrews chapter number one, restored that image. The Bible says, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. Amen. So what's in store for man? Well, it's not a house with a mailbox on the corner of Hallelujah Square, my dear friend. That's all nice, good singing, man, praise God. But what's in store for you is the very life of God. A life, my dear friend, that had no beginning and will have no end. And therefore, being made in the image of God, he has a destiny for you. Being right now made a little lower than the angels, according to the book of Hebrews chapter number 2, but one day you will be infinitely above the angels. For the Bible says the time will come when you will judge angels. They'll be brought before you. Huh? And no angel in the scriptures ever said to be made in the image of God, but you are. So we have a destiny, we have a purpose, we have a reason, and it's our place to find that. And if we find God, or better yet, he finds us, you'll begin to understand what this is all about. We rejoice in Adam, but I want to call your attention, the, the theme of the message this morning is this. I'm going to give you three men, and these three men can only take you so far. Each one of them has their purpose on this earth, but they can only take you so far. Adam, for example, we rejoice in his authority. He was made king over the kingdom of heaven and king over the kingdom of earth. He was fully qualified to be both because he was a sinless creature created in the image of God. At that time, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of, 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 of God were both simultaneous, running concurrently on this earth in one 
man who had the throne, who had the crown over all of it. But once he sinned against God and became a fallen creature, he was no longer qualified to rule over the kingdom of God. My dear friend, that, in, that brought forth the prophecy where we must be born again. And so from this first Adam who lost that image through falling from the grace of God in the sense that he had sinned and no, and no longer the king over the kingdom of God, it did not, it could not have been, it could not come again until John chapter number three, when the Lord Jesus Christ said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And that new birth could not be ratified in plain words, it could not come into existence until the death of the testator in Hebrews chapter number nine. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he died upon the cross, he not only saved you, he restored the image of God and he gave you a birth that the natural birth could never give you. So we rejoice in that, in his authority. But we also rejoice in the authority, in the, in the discernment of Adam. It says in 1 Timothy chapter number two and verse 13, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So there's something happening here in this garden. And we see that Adam, my dear friend, is not a fool. He has not been duped. He knows exactly what has happened to his bride. And because he makes a choice this day, he becomes a greater type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Adam chose to die for his bride. How did he do that? Because he and his bride became one. Whatever happened to her happens to him. And so there before God, he chose his bride to say, if you destroy her, you'll have to destroy me too. It was like Moses when God said to Moses, after he led the children of Israel after 400 years of Egyptian bondage he said to him cast these people aside to paraphrase him cast them aside and I'll make another nation and I'll give you more people from a different place and Moses said if you strike their name from that book that you've written take my name out of it also oh how that but you say well that's rebellion oh no 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 how that must have warmed the heart of God because this man now had chosen to die with his people we got a real leader now now. Amen. And God knew it and so did Moses. And so did Adam. And we also look at, at him in Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 14. And that is that his love for Eve. He not only chose to die for her, he loved her. The Bible said, the Lord said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this thing, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. I know a lot of people call attention to the Hebrew word here simply means offspring. But my dear friend, they're trying to force something here that's not in the text. Take it for what it says. The seed of the woman. That's what it's translated. And I, and I accept that. What's, what's that mean? The woman doesn't have a seed, preacher. That seed is not a physical seed. It's a spiritual seed that takes physical properties. Are you listening? The Lord Jesus Christ came down a spirit being into this world. Amen. The body of Christ did not come down from heaven, folks. The God-man's body did not come down from heaven. It came from the womb of the virgin, but it came into existence in the womb of the virgin by the power of the Spirit of Almighty God. This is what the seed's talking about here in the book of Genesis. Chapter number four and verse one, Adam knew his wife, she conceived, bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, Abel a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a of the ground. It, it appears that Eve was thinking, now God is fulfilling his promise of Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman through Cain. Not so, my dear friend. Not so. Not so at all. But I want you to notice carefully what it says in Genesis 3.22. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. And so the Bible said in Genesis 3, 24, So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. What we have here is a big but, my dear friend, but... Look what Adam caused to happen. There is in that garden a tree of life. A tree of life. Now what was that tree of life? I can't define it. 
And we can't define it in the book of Revelation, but it shows up in the beginning and in the end. But I'll tell you this, I believe it, but I also believe that that tree of life is without doubt a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says that his wisdom is a tree of life, this wisdom of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the giver of life. He is life to all that accept him. So here in the book of Genesis, the tree of life can be counterfeited because if you do a research, just simply do a research on it, you'll find that practically every culture out there is talking about a tree of life. Isn't that a remarkable thing? Why do they do that? They do that because of an ancient knowledge that has been perverted. There are elements of the truth out in the pagan world, but elements of the truth. Why? Because at one time men knew the truth but they turned away from the truth. And because of that, they're left in darkness. God called the Jewish people aside, told Moses to write a book, and to them was given the oracles of God. Therefore, the truth of God is not to be looked for in the pagan world. Open your Bible, and there you'll get the truth of Almighty God. For example, today, the Jews have in the Kabbalah what is called the Sephirot. These are emanations from a so-called spirit being. What they've done is perverted the truth of the word of God. This, my friend, shows you how far they've deviated from the scriptures because there's nothing in the Bible that will talk about an emanation from God. The Kabbalah and all that it's associated with. This is the new age type Christ. The new age type spirit. The new age that's being preached in the churches today. For example, there's a counterfeit Jesus. Did you know that? There's a counterfeit Christ. Amen. He's called the false Christ. Pseudopistos. He's called the antichrist because he's against him. There's a false spirit, a counterfeit spirit. The spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. He make you feel good. He can make you feel good about yourself. And he can even bless you with physical things. You say, are you, are you serious, preacher? When Satan offered the kingdoms of this world to our Lord. In the book of Luke chapter number four, that wasn't a vain promise, an empty promise. He could have done it. He said, it's been given to me and I can do with it whatsoever I will. So my dear friend, there is a counterfeit gospel so what's the gospel? Christ died for your sins according to the scripture. He was buried according to the scriptures and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father and will come again to receive them unto himself. Christ died, buried, and rose again the third day. Do you believe in that Christ today? Do you know the true one? And there's a counterfeit church. They're everywhere to be found today. But the true church of God is not brick and mortar. It's not this. What is it? It's a Bible-believing, born-again body of believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's his church. Amen. So while Adam lost it in a garden, and Christ regained what Adam lost in a garden. For at the Garden of Gethsemane, that word Gethsemane means an olive press. His very life was being pressed out of him. He was in the midst of a press pressure and turmoil that no man has ever, ever had to face. On one side, the powers of hell coming against him, and on the other side, the wrath and holiness of Almighty God. Imagine being caught in the middle between that and our Lord Jesus Christ came out of it, my dear friend. He said, my father, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. And boy, you read Hebrews chapter number five and it makes it plain that God heard the prayer of his son. So Adam can only take you so far, but he cannot take you into the presence of God. He cannot take you where you're born of the spirit of God, where you've got peace in your soul, but Christ can. Abraham can only take you so far. We rejoice in his call, in his obedience. Abraham, the Bible says, knowing not where he was going, he left Ur of the Chaldees. He left Ur of the Chaldees and went off following the, the voice of God. And he went north through the Fertile Crescent. He came from the Valley of Mesopotamia. The word means the land between the rivers, the cradle of civilization. And there he left and he traversed to the north. Then he came down into the south, into the land of Israel. The land promised to Abraham there in Genesis 15. And so he came and God blessed him. We rejoice in his obedience. We rejoice in his faith. God said, I want you to look into the heavens. Abraham looked up into the heavens. He was familiar with that. 
for the Babylonians and the Chaldeans where he came from. They were enamored with the stars of the heavens. Oh, how they looked at them at night. You can go back and look at their civilization. You can see all of that. But my dear friend, what Abraham saw was different from what they saw. Amen. What he saw was the countless number of stars. And God said, Abraham, I want you to look at that. He said, as you see that, you can't number them. Go ahead and try to number them. He you can't. He said, so shall thy seed be. He became the father. Abram was what he was called when he came from Ur of the Chaldees. But God changed his name to Abraham. Amen. The fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Abraham. He came out as father and God changed him to high father. In plain words, every soul on the face of this earth, if they ever come into the Lord God in a new birth, they will come by the way of Abraham's faith. He believed God and God Almighty blessed him. The apostle said in Galatians 3 verse 6, even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. The apostle says in Galatians 3 14, the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Galatians, Galatians 3 16, and to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are we talking about, what are we talking about? Seed, not in the plural, in the singular. The Lord Jesus Christ, if you look at Matthew chapter number 1, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That seed started in Genesis 3.15. That seed was a spiritual thing of faith. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, it was faith that brought him here. This young Jewish girl, when he and Gabriel announced to her that you're going to bear a son, she said, be it so to me according to thy word. And by faith she received it. And by faith that seed came into her body. And by faith the body of the Lord Jesus Christ was put into her womb. And then nine months later born into this world. Galatians 3.18 If the inheritance be of the law it is no more promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. And this lifts him above the Jews of his day. Two thousand years ago. For the Jews of his day were big on the law. They were big on all of that. But the, 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 the apostle said to them, yes, but Abraham is 1,900 B.C., 500 years before the law ever showed up. And he was blessed and the promise and God's gift. And it was all before the law ever came into existence. Then finally, Galatians 4, 22, Abraham had two sons. The one by a bond made the other by a free woman. This is a separate study in itself. And let me tell you what's going on right now, October the 7th in Israel. What's going on right now with Iran, maybe attacking Israel. What's been going on with this blood feud for generations. It is a family affair, my dear friends. Amen. A lot of people like to reduce it to political. No, my dear friend, it is family. It is a blood feud. You see, the Arab and the Jew have the same father. And I know a lot of Americans don't have a clue what I'm talking about. They've got the same father. Who's that Abraham? But the Arab's mother is Hagar, the Egyptian, and the Jew's mother. Who's the Jew's mother? Amen. So where can Abraham take you? He can take you to all these places. But Abraham, my dear friend, died. And he had to be replaced. And the Lord Jesus Christ will take you where Abraham never could. And then finally, we'll talk about Moses. Moses can only take you so far. He can take you from Egypt's throne to God's people. Yes, he can. For he saw an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew one day and said, Surely God has chosen me to deliver these people. So how, why would he say that, preacher? Because it says in Hebrews chapter number 11 that he chose the afflictions or the sufferings of God's people over the pleasures of Egypt. He knew that he was a special birth. He knew God had his hand on him. For a special reason, he can take you from idolatry to the top of Sinai. Yes, sir, Moses can take you there. He can take you from ignorance to a priesthood, coming out of the paganism of Egyptian bondage. But they never lost their identity. They knew who they were. This is why they lived in Goshen. Goshen was a separate land, part of Egypt. This was where God had separated them unto himself. He can take you from Midian to Nebo. Yes, he can. He can tell, where's Nebo? Well, Midian is where he was called while he was shepherding the sheep. And, my dear friend, Nebo is where God took him. And he said, now I want you to look as far as you can from the north to the south. And I want you to take in all this land that's before you. And Moses looked at it. And what a beautiful sight it was. 
There at the top of Nebo, Moses no doubt longed in his heart to be able to go into that land, this land of God. But God said, Moses, you can't go. I'm sorry, you smote that rock the second time. You can't go. You see, my friend, Moses can take you if you're a law keeper. He can take you to the top of Nebo. He can let you see the blessings of the people of God. He can let you see the joy that's on their face. He can let you see the victory that's in their life. But you're a law keeper. You'll never be able to enter into the land of Israel. It takes a Joshua to take you across that river. It takes a Joshua to drop that Jericho. It takes a Joshua, my dear friend, to raise the sword of the Lord and to drive the enemy from the land. It takes a Joshua. And friend, over there in the book of Acts, chapter number seven, when Stephen was going to be stoned to death, he called that Joshua Jesus. Amen which meant that he must have been a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of you are stuck at Nebo. You can't get off of Nebo. You can see it, but you don't have it. You wonder, oh, this is just an act. This is just a bunch of hypocrisy. I know how they are. What do you think was going on up here this morning? I'm gonna tell you something, that time sitting still. This, when you get this close, like I was, I mean, you feel this all over the place. It is the power of God. It's the presence of the Holy One. It is the moving of the Spirit of the living God. Something jumps up and leaps up in your soul. Something begins to move in your very being. There's joy that comes out in the face of hell itself. I'll tell you something, folks. This cannot be taken from you. Satan hates it. This was joy. This was power. Thanks be unto God for a choir that sings like that. Amen. And I hope you got something from that. But some of you are at Nebo. You can't get off of Nebo. You got your laws all around you. You can't go any further than Nebo. And you say, what do you mean by that, preacher? I mean that you're not willing to go on to the Lord Jesus Christ who will take you in plain words, Joshua, friend. When they camped at Gilgal, they rolled their reproach away. They prepared to grow, go across that river, the Jordan, the descender that came from Hermon in the north to the Dead Sea in the south. It descends. You've got to cross that picture river of death in order to enter into that land. And so, my friend, a lot of you have gotten to Nebo, but you can't get any further. It's like Moses. Was there a better man in the Old Testament than Moses? No. Do I hold Moses in high esteem? You better believe I do. Do I respect Moses and Abraham and Adam? Yes, sir. With all of my heart. But none of them can take you into the presence of Almighty God. Amen. I want you to notice something. You, the law, can enlighten you. Moses gave us the law. It can enlighten you and can show you your guilt. It can show you your sin. That's what the law was written for. You read his law and it begins to make you uncomfortable, no question. And you say, well, then what do I do? Well, see, that's the key. That's the mystery. That's the lesson of the preaching of the word of God. You can't do anything. It's already been done. It's my place to show you what has been done. Now look at this. There are elements in the law that you might rejoice over. For example, sacrifice, confession. They put the hand on the head of the sacrifice and confess their sins. No doubt there was, some repeat, there was some relief and some peace for a while. But listen to what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse number 15. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death... How many are there? Because this is one of the most important scriptures you'll read. And you seldom ever hear this preached today from the pulpit. Because most folks that feel like, well, this is just too theological and too deep. And, you know, we don't, what we need to hear about is how God's going to bless us and we feel good about ourselves. And, and we get up in the morning and we have a positive attitude toward this and that and this and that and this and that. And on and on and on and on and on you go. That's what's killed the church. It sucked the very life out of it. There's no power in it. Delicate Hebrews 9, 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. This is what this Bible just said to me. It said that when Christ died on the cross, he not only died for the sins of the people alive in his day, he died for the sins of the people that would sin in the future. But he also died for the sins of those in the past. 
And notice the word that he used, redemption. There's two elements involved in a forgiveness of sin. Number one is the forgiveness of it. God forgave the Old Testament saint. He was forgiven. But what did he do with his sin? Here's what he says in Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse 1. Verse 4. Hebrews 10, 4. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should do what? Take them away. Well, if he couldn't take them away, where were they? You see, we've got an issue going on. Now we go to Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 3. For the law, having a shadow of things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year. Now look at this. Continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sin, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance of again made of sins every year. Amen. You see, my friend, the Old Testament saint was forgiven, but his conscience could never be cleansed because he would always remember. Why would he always remember? Because they weren't taken away. If you remember John the Baptist, when he saw the Lord Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God that does what? Taketh away. I don't know if you follow me this morning, but when God saved my soul, he forgave me. Oh, I, I, he forgave me. Praise God, he forgave me. But he did more than that. He took my guilt and sins away. Amen. And when he took them away, he replaced it with joy, peace, power, love, forgiveness. He put something in its place that they could not have in the Old Testament because only the blood of Christ can take your sins away. This is why an unsaved man today who's a religionist, he believes everything you believe. He believes all the Christian catechisms. He believes the, the, the Westminster profession of faith and all that stuff. He believes all that, okay? But he's not born again. And though he's constantly working at it, He'll feel good for a while. He'll do penance. He'll give gifts. He'll go somewhere. He'll make a pilgrimage. You know, do all the things in, the, in, their, in, the, in, 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 in what he's doing. I'm not up here to be so critical to these things. But the point is, that doesn't give peace to the soul. Only you in this house today who know what I'm talking about when your sins were gone. He took them away. And that's when peace, like a river, that's when joy unspeakable and full of glory, that's when the power of God begins to reside in your soul. That's when you wake up and you say, I'm not what I used to be. Ha! And I'm not anymore what I used to be. I'm a new creature in Christ. And boy, in that living room, and Sandra Hayworth sitting here this morning, in her living room, when my head came up, man, I'm telling you, I looked around me and I said, hold on, <laughs> something has happened to me. I didn't say it verbally, I did in my soul because I had changed. And all of that guilt, all of that garbage, all of that baggage, all of that junk that had been on my soul just before that, it was gone. And it didn't come back. And it's not just some psychological, psychiatric idea where well, you've said something, you feel better for a while. No, it's not a while. That was in 1973. It's been a while. It's been 50 years. Amen. And it's still gone. Oh, yeah. Did you get a hold of that? Because that's a great truth. It really is. That's a great truth. You can be forgiven, but the sin will never be removed until... The blood of Christ was shed at the cross. Yes, Hebrews 5, 9, and said, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. The word author, I like the way the apostle uses that word. The author, like you're writing a book or a treatise or something of that nature. And being made perfect, he, it's not that he was imperfect, it was perfection was perfected, okay? That's what that means. 
He being made perfect became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Wherefore, verse 25, Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7, 25. Wherefore, this is a conclusion based on what he has said, based on the facts. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost. That's the eternal salvation that he's the author of. He's able to save to the uttermost. All that, that come unto him, that come unto God by him. See, now look at this. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. Amen. So we have the dual ministry of Christ. There is one God. Folks, one God. And one mediator between God and men. The man. The God man. The man, Christ Jesus. He, li he lives at the right hand of the Father now, ministering by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the glorified Christ. The Holy Spirit of God ministers to you what comes forth from the Son, who receives it from the Father, to help you, to bless you, to strengthen you, to cleanse you in your present life in the flesh. That is what we call sanctification, a progressive sanctification, but that is not the new birth. The new birth is a one-time event that takes place at the moment that you are born of the Spirit of God and He comes in to reside in your soul. From that day on, you are His forever and that will never change. And therefore, there's the dual salvation that's given to us. You're not saved twice, but the two parts. Your life on this earth and then your spirit at the right hand of the Father. Amen. How many of you in this house this morning, you're at Nebo. You can't get off of Nebo. You're stuck. Well, you see, you can't get off of Nebo. Moses could not have gone down into the land. It takes the power of God to do it. How many of you have tried and tried and tried to be saved and born again? And you failed. And you mean well. And I don't know what I'm talking about. I've talked to people all the time. You're serious. You're genuine. <laughs> As genuine as you can be, but it just you just see you just say I just I've tried I've tried I've tried and it doesn't work for me. Quit trying and come down and take hold of a hand who will extend it to you. Amen. And so you take hold of me in whatever small amount of faith you've got. You just take hold of me. I'll take care of the rest. Amen. That's salvation. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Would you be willing to do that? And Christian, would you be willing to come and get back where you need to be and you know what it was like to have all that garbage off of you? How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? I mean junk. Good night. And it's gone. Praise God. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, I'm back on the cross with a thief. Remember me. That's, just, that's, that's good enough for me. Remember me. Remember me. In your holy name I pray, my blessed Savior. In Jesus' name. Your heads are bowed. Would anybody raise your hand this morning and say, Preacher Lawson, I, you're talking to me. You're talking to me. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you here. Two or three hands that have gone up. God bless you. Another hand in the back. Another two or three over here now. Well, praise God. That's a bunch of people. And folks, it's not about numbers in here. You look on these walls in here. You don't see any numbers anywhere. I'm not interested in numbers. Would you like to know what I'm talking about? He'll meet you where you'll, he'll meet you. If you're willing to come, he'll meet you. Won't you do it? Before we sing right now, just slip out of your seat and come down here to the front. And just take hold. As the old timers used to say, take hold of that nail scarred hand. That's salvation, folks. The Son is salvation. He that hath the Son. Would you do it? In Jesus' name. Would you do it? Come on down here. If you want somebody to pray with you, we'd be glad to. We'd be glad to. We got a we got a number of preachers in the house here today. People will be glad to pray with you if you come down. you don't have to have anybody with you the Holy Ghost will do the job because he'll bring you to Christ Father bless your word 
thank you that this messenger had another opportunity. I'm, I'm free now, Lord. I'm, I'm full and I'm empty, both. Hallelujah to God. <laughs> yes, Lord, full and empty at the same time. I've emptied myself of that responsibility, but I'm full, Lord, I'm full. I'm full. You've blessed me. Oh, God, how you've blessed me, Lord. You've blessed me. In thy name I pray. Won't you come? It's time of prayer now. Holy Ghost is in here. Christian, be a good time. Start back with him today. Start back with him. Come on, start back with him. This will be a good time. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It's a good time, folks. Start back with him. I don't know how much time we got left. A lot of folks preaching about the coming of the Lord. And who, I hope he does. Uh, listen, this is one preacher that would love to see him come today. You better believe it. But I'm not setting any dates. I'm not going to do that. You can do that. But if you'd like to get back with him, today can be a day to do it. Would you come down to the front here? This is a time of prayer. Can you sense the Spirit? Yes, you can, can't you? Yes. Well, it's the house of God, folks. There was a time of rejoicing and joy. Amen. At the beginning of the service, joy, rejoicing in the power and the victory of Christ. Now there's a time of prayer. Amen. Will you pour your soul out to the Lord? You talk to Him. You talk to Him. Won't you do that?